So I uh, sense that you guys still have quite a bit of uh, uh, load, right, in other courses right now, stacking up to the end of semester. So you know, kind of need to navigate this a bit. So you're not terribly overburdened, but nevertheless, there's a few points I need to, you know, get, get from you. <laughs> So I can't just let you go and say, hey, you know, we blanket this whole thing, everyone gets an A for that part, and then we go from there. Alternative two, we skip this thing, and I redistribute the marks across the other two assignments. I see smiles on their faces. I can't do that either. So, uh, but, so, but we want to make this as comfortable as possible. But also, I saw a lot of you actually have put quite some effort into designing both the project, but also starting to execute it. So that should be rewarded. That's the main, uh, main point of this activity in the first place. So. Um, but I recognize that, you know, that you have quite a bit of uh, uh, work on your hands right now. And I think in the other courses, there's quite a bit of uh, assignments and projects that you get on top of this, even though I had thought that we would be a bit more lightweight. But uh, that's something I need to learn from you as well towards the end of semester or even now. Um, remember, I have this feedback um, page on the um, on the wiki so that you can at any time uh, add, add to, but also an anonymous form. So if you just don't feel you want to put something there. Uh, you just use that form and then put it in there. I will ask towards the end of semester also about load, like, uh, you know, wh wh where load is disproportionately high to low, <laughs> or um, so what, what we, you know, I could do to accommodate this a bit more. Because as you, as you know, this is, semester is a bit, um, uh, requires readjustments by us particularly, because we are used to you, uh, that is your previous cohort, having three courses per semester, not four. And you know we, we are kind of trying to to chop down, but we always insist on this strong passive practical aspect, and it turns out that could be a bit overburdening. So we kind of need to respond to this, and uh, um, we are aware. So, um, but in any case, for my part, I'm quite aware of this. Um, so I want to learn how far we can navigate this. So it's still fair because we could also just say, hey, you know, you don't do all the assignments for one course, you're back to the old model, and uh, but that's not happening. So we need to kind of find a redistribution scheme that works. In this slide, so uh, if feedback be good, otherwise I'll ask for it anyway towards the end more um, once we have a good bearing. So question number two, uh, does anyone have this uh, project, project they are working on? Either idea or something that's in the workings? Because I saw uh, uh, the, 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 the proposals that people make are really good. I think it's, I like it so, because it's so nice to see something that you wouldn't think about. Uh, because otherwise my assignment are a bit boring for me myself because I thought them up, I guess, so that's not really too exciting. So I'm always looking forward to see a bit of uh, sparks from your side. So, and you realize things that you hopefully can also use beyond the course, right? It's, I mean, it's your work in the end. Uh, uh, make, make as much or as little, if you like, use of it or try out things. Um, but also means that they're, of course, highly heter heterogeneous in structure, right? So no project is the same, right? So that will be quite a challenge for us when we need to look at the evaluation, right? Or should we just uh, roll dice? I think that's more fun, but I don't think it would be fair. If we take a dice, it only has six, on it. like for A or B or something. Anyway, uh, no weighted uh, dice throwing thing. No, so we kind of need to go through it and think about it. Um, but uh, important aspect there, something we want to do, and I'll reserve a slot for that. We're running a bit out of time, and I'm happy to take the blame. Um, I'll probably aim uh, for presentations on the, uh, yeah, if we can, in two weeks, like the 3rd of May, that is still teaching a territory, right? And the idea is there that you guys present what you have until then, right? So the point is here, don't confuse this with that line, right? It's just a tiny nuisance that you need in your life um, to kind of uh, present what, what you have been up to. Also, if that's conflicting with some other deadline obligation, whatever else you have right now, just let me know. But it should be low key. It's really about, you know, what's your idea? Kind of a bit of like a pitch, but also seeing you show your progress. But also uh, the main point here is that you may get feedback that you can consider, right? Oh, what does it, you know, uh, you know, uh, did you try this one? Does this work? Did you think about this and so on? So there's this opportunity to get some experience and get feedback. That's that's why I think it's quite useful as well. Also, on the other hand, it, it keeps your eyes um, and two perspectives. On the one hand, the implementation, but also the idea, right? Because later on, when you are devising some services, doing robot, uh, prototyping and so on, it's often not so much about the implementation, but also about, you know, what's the bigger picture, right? So dragging back to this, because you're, you guys are meant to kind of uh, think about the you know, whole project holistically, not just as, as parts of it. So and I think that's quite a useful idea to uh, you know, have you do it. Plus, 
you need to do it anyway later on, uh, later in the bachelor, presenting your own work. So it's always good to have a bit of an activity and exercise before that, right? You have other courses where you need to do this right now, fourth year, fourth semester, DB? Yeah, 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 some sort of presentation as part of the class. Okay, so because I don't want to double pack you either on that one. So, you know, I'm kind of trying to navigate nicely around all your obligations. And we need to bear in mind your two different degrees. So I need to also park, ask the big prop people and yeah, my big prop person. So there is one big prop people, that's good. Um, so um, that, that is not conflicting there as well, right? Because that's yeah, too much load otherwise. So 3rd of May is the IO posted on the wiki then as well. Again, don't, you know, see as a, just to be super clear, you don't need to have the project finished by then, right? So it's all about the idea and the structure that you have developed today. How should the structure look different? Yeah. So the, the idea uh, of the presentation, I mean, given uh, the amount of group, number of groups, I don't think we'll, uh, I would like to keep it to five to seven minutes max, kind of that level, right? So um, the idea is basically um, the, the, the corner points are, uh, what's the topic about? Perhaps a bit of a motivation. You kind of start with the motivation, you know, wouldn't it be nice if you could or whatever else, right? Or we have this issue, let's say Corona, and here's mine. You know? So that kind of uh, uh, angle on it. Then you see, uh, show what the general features are, the requirements you kind of set yourself to some extent, right? And um, then um, how you solved it. You can, for example, introduce diagrams for this, just talk over it, um, but then also link it to the technologies, how they use them. So, because we can only give feedback uh, based on the information that you give us, right? So if you give us a sense of, for example, how the service structure and interaction looks like, some sort of diagram, however that would be, then people could, you know, it, we get a, get, a, get a sense and say, hey, yeah, but you could also do it, you know, another way, for example, or why are you doing this way and so on, right? Because we'll probably not get down to the code level, of course, in those seven minutes and say, hey, let's go through your handler. Uh, or handlers, that's probably not happening. But uh, you would, of course, be free to show up, you know, show also something that you think you did very cleverly, right? So if you, for example, you have a very algorithm centric approach and you think you have a good solution to it, then you're more than free, of course, to show code as well if you feel that's um, um, relevant. But the main point is really motivational. And then also, like from an architectural point of view, how you structured your service, you want to see that a bit. Uh, uh, how you uh, tie up the bit the, the, the different elements, right? So in a sensical manner. So you know you would not necessarily want to have a persistence feature in there just to have the persistence feature, but it needs to correspond to one of the you know benefits that you actually promise to the user, right? So in be it caching, be it uh, keeping user information, right? So and of course signaling persistence. So meaning if your service goes down, you can recover, and uh, you know all those kind of. Um, considerations you um, would have placed into into this uh, project. So if you had done it like assignment one way, don't need persistence. Of course, that's uh, it would be very artificial to find a Firebase representation in there, right? But you have uh, considerable flexibility in kind of uh, in terms of design and the features you can pick and choose from because you kind of were forced to implement uh, most of those anyway already as part of the initial assignments. But now you have a bit more flexibility to to explore. So I'm. Since we're not too prescriptive, it's uh, really more important that you uh, tell us why you felt you needed to use some of those and not just because it's a requirement of the assignment, because it needs to come out of. Usually, I find by setting those requirements, we naturally get sufficient uh, about the right level of complexity of the services. Because you're thinking, okay, you know, I need to have a feature set that corresponds to it, right? So it kind of naturally kind of converges in, in my experience, but we'll see if that's the case or not. Um, in, in, um, when, when we talk about this more. Okay, um, good. So everyone is somewhat organized. That's the main point. So you can be uh, productive on this one uh, as part of the last um, activity. So one other aspect that's um, important in, in any program, but also in cloud uh, computing um, that we hadn't talked about before too much uh, was one particular subject. What was that? What did I talk about last time? like last year to me. Every time I, I work from home, it feels very different than being here. And that felt like ages ago, the last time we met up here was before Easter. But let's assume we still have a memory. Um, what did I talk about last week? Did I forget it? Or did I talk to myself? Or 
Yes, I talked about 2019. One aspect that's quite um, relevant because we're talking about professionalism right now, you kind of let loose a bit in your project, right? So you need to look at the professional aspects a bit more independently and can rely not so much on the prescription of uh, based on the assignment and so on, but most of it, the kind of stuff you breathe already anyway, like Git commits and uh, things like this, right? Good frequent commits using, um, um, and, and, you know, branching where it's sensible and possible if you are, especially in a group setting and so on. Yeah, testing, there it is exactly in the chat. Thank you very much. So testing was the one I talked about. And um, the the idea, I think, group um, specifics, did I talk about anything that was new to you or was that all old stuff? Is there anything else specific that I talked about that would be relevant for you that you should probably consider? Again, I think for the assignment, of, sorry, for the project, it would be very sensible to think about testing as, a, as one of the integral features um, to shape single professionalism and um, you know reliability of your system as it would have been for you for oh caching yeah okay um Smart students, students will have open up the wiki yeah Okay, I didn't say that. Uh, Jan Gunnar suggests that the wiki would give it away. So I talk a bit about uh, testing, different forms of testing, right? So we have the classic unit testing that we do in using the testing framework in, in, in uh, using, using um, uh, yeah, stock standard uh, environments. The ID is supported quite generally, but I talked about some other forms of testing as well. What did I particularly look at or suggested you to look at or hope you will look at? There's one package in the standard API, in fact, that's less visible to some extent. Yep, there's a coming, uh, the concept I talked about was stubbing, that's right. Um, get back to that in a second, but what was the, the package I talked about? You don't remember? It's literally written there. HTTP test, yes, we didn't do look at go mocking yet, but we looked at HTTP test. The idea was basically, um, well, um, to, 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 to forward this a bit, um, to have a stub of a service that is basically bare minimum responsive to a client side request, right? That you can nevertheless use then to run, uh, you know, some, some um, um, you know, um, tests against in a way, in order to show that your connectivity, for example, is properly established, that you return things in the right format and so on. So it doesn't need to have the full implementation, all the magic that underlies it, let alone drawing on third party services, right? So that's not a requirement. So if you're looking, for example, at the uh, countries, um, um, the rest countries, sorry, API on something like this, you could just bluntly return one given country all the time, as long as you can use it in order to ensure that you're um, uh, parsing works correctly, right? So that was one of the, the ideas. And uh, to do that, we need to have a server side that is minimal um, and basically allows you to test handlers in particular. You don't need to genuinely stop the service. You could also, of course, put the full implementation of the handler there. I'll just bring up the um, example again, just to so anyone who's now not following, just to ensure that we are all somewhat on the same page. Um, but you can actually test your actual handler in, 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 uh, as part of this as well. Hang on. Uh -huh. Actually, my screen, I can see. Um, Let's see, just to go back there. So resolving takes a while. Um, yeah, so that's basically the idea that we have a uh, test. Come on. My machine is a bit uh, used because it's still uh, processing the video from the last session I held just before. Um, all right, so the, the idea is basically to have some, some test environment where we test the server side handler. And as part of this, uh, the idea was to use an HTTP server, right? So to kind of really emulate the full process. Uh, and um, this is basically using the uh, 
um, HTTP test package. And how it's set up is here again, right? So HTTP uh, test new server, and we just add any sort of handler function we can come up with. In this instance, uh, it actually um, you know, reflects a simplified handler that we can use to um, you know, model behavior, but you could also inject your actual handler. Right? the one that you actually developed by reference, right? So it doesn't need to be stopped per se, um, but it just uh, can use the actual uh, functionality if you want it to. However, if you want to have a, if you have a server side handler that does complex tasks with third parties, it's a little bit tricky. You need to be very, very mindful that you have, you know, if you have external dependencies, but especially with self-contained, then it's um, a good idea to kind of inject it. Uh, and then this is responsive um, um, to any possible invocation you can get. One thing, again, I bring this back up because people may make may come across this. How do you invoke it? It's important to retrieve the URL of the instantiated service, right? So if you have uh, created an instance of the server, uh, ensure in this instance here, for example, it's um, returning the server reference, so the running HTTP test server, and it has a um, Field called uh, uh, called dot URL, um, and that's the URL you need to invoke. That's the service where it's running on, right? So you find that the URL can be at times a bit, um, yeah, um, not something you should test for, of course, because it's it, it changes all the time depending on your platform and so on. Um, but so the essence here was um, that's the main point that we kind of inject uh, an existing handler or a, more, a stopped handler that is a handler that has very simplistic functionality. Uh, akin to the one that we're showing here, that basically just you know spitting out content every time, every time the same, uh, every time the same format doesn't really matter, but it allows you to do basic testing on the server functionality, uh, or at least the interaction between the server, so the protocols and so on. And on the client side, you do the actual evaluation. That was the main point, right? You do uh, test that the status code you get returned, or let's say that the uh, content you get returned actually correspond to what you expected, and throw an error otherwise, right? Using the T, the testing framework T dot um, error or load fatal if it's if you want to stop execution outright. So that was the uh, HTTP test package that you can use. So that's probably the one you want to think about because the main aspect you want to test is um, uh, uh, likely the the um, server you know your server side behavior, your uh, handlers and so on, and kind of um, put them into tests that use the HTTP test package um, as the basis. So, but the key thing is there that um, as of now, that was the motivation, the behavior that was basically uh, tested and evaluated to, to, uh, to that extent was the interaction between client and server, particularly whatever the server uh, responded, right? So the server is kind of a tested entity uh, there. So another perspective, however, is of course to think about the client side. And um, so this is where we basically mock the server side here to have some sort of response that allows us, of course, possibly also to test client, client uh, functionality, of course, but uh, likewise server side functionality um, as well. So, but we of course also need to deal with the converse um, um, aspect. And that is, how do we ensure that our clients actually doing the right thing, right? So we have instances or had instances at least last week of uh, repeated in, uh, interrogation or invocation rather of third party services, um, you know, outside. So, and how do you test this, right? How do you actually know that, you know, you're, you're not constantly invoking uh, third party, um, 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 you know, services or software and so on. So the key idea is there to twist, to turn this around. We need to find a way of doing it the other way around where we basically have the client that is to be tested based on the behavior it, 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 it displays. And the evaluation of this needs to happen on the server side, right? So now the server is not just you know returning something, but the server actually needs to be actively involved in the evaluation. So and generally, how that works is by um, using the concept of um, of mocking. So whereas the stop has basically a simplified version of the actual implementation on the server side, right? It returns the you know, whatever, always the same country, it doesn't really matter, but a simplified version of the actual uh, functionality that the server provides. The mocking idea is basically there that the server pretends to uh, receive responses and possibly also returns those, you know, uh, um, 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 mocked responses, but at the same time, it does something else. It actually um, 
uh, records invocation as well. So it actually it keeps track of the behavior that the client performs. I mean, there's from a testing perspective, uh, some cleverness on, on, on the part of the server as well, not just a, uh, a you know, dumb response uh, to repeated invocation. And this concept is then referred to uh, as mocking because only that makes it possible to kind of evaluate that the server side, uh, the client side is actually behaving as expected. So it's kind of a bit of a use in, the, in a counter um, counter setting um, right now. And unlike for, yes, unlike for all the functionality on the um, HTTP side and uh, the conventional unit testing that uh, you have seen already for the server side, there is no framework or there's no mocking framework out of the box available as part of, of Golang. So it's, or it, 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 you know, uh, at least not in the standard API, if you like. And, uh, but incrementally, it turns out that uh, GoMock has become more or less the, the go-to tool for this kind of purpose, right? So similar to uh, Java, where JUnit is the de facto standard for testing, uh, same here, I think Mock, GoMock uh, appears to have kind of emerged amongst competition, of course, uh, as one of the frameworks to go for. So if there are other ones you want to explore, um, go for it, of course. I mean, in fact, I'm going as far as you don't, uh, not suggesting that you need to do that for your, for your project. I just want to show you that perspective. Of how it's possibly done using Go, but there are also other frameworks that kind of do the um, the same thing. So how does mocking work in, in this particular world? Um, I also will be honest about the shortcomings of that framework as far as I've encountered them or not being able to um, work around them. Um, so if that's the case, then I'll uh, share those experiences as well. So let me just. Um... So how does it fundamentally work? Um, the key concept that um, GoMock, and therefore, uh, is, you should see this as a, a representative for pretty much any mocking framework. They roughly work the same way, um, even though they have um, uh, slight variations. For example, in Java side, there's also a mocking framework called Mokito, for example and various other ones, and you'll find the syntax is nearly the same as well. So the, the, the expectation is that um, there, are some sort of, um, there are some conventions that have emerged over time. And how does it work in practice? Well, first of all, you need to think about the kind of um, server-side interface that you want to have. And the contrast here is instead of um, implementing the actual server-side, um, um, yeah, providing the server-side implementation directly, this is completely left to the mocking framework. So here the idea is merely to emulate some sort of um, server-side behavior you'd expect. If this was the DB service, guess what? We would have a function that initializes the database, that inserts something in the database, that gets something from the database, perhaps does a count or whatever and delete or entries. It doesn't matter, you define the interface, right? So, um, which would be of course a bit different in other uh, instance, and it may return an error and so on. So that's all the specification you basically provide. Um, the idea is then, now, given the signature of the corresponding um, functions that are uh, embedded here, so for example, insert taking a string, returning an error, this is enough, well, to some extent, enough information for uh, GoMob to kind of generate um, the functionality that we need. And I uh, just want to display this here. Um, for this purpose, however, you need to use, and um, I think I mentioned it in the slides, or I, I, I think I mentioned it also in the, in the wiki, you will need to, um, let me just go to the website to motivate this so you know what I'm talking about. You need to actually download a uh, tool that you could, of course, embed in your tool chain if you wanted to, or simply run manually. What it will do is, um, basically generate the mock from the interface. And the tool is called mockgen. So here's some installation instructions that are all uh, sensible and important here. The tool is that one, um, mockgen. And this is kind of the um, uh, generation tool set that basically takes this interface, populates it with the recording facilities. So again, recording facilities are about counting number invocation, how it was inc uh, invoked and all that kind of stuff. So this is largely um, standardized based on the, um, um, you know, information that you provided as part of the interface and mocking kind of populates this whole um, um, uh, interface and provides a corresponding implementation for this one. So 
just to show an example. Let's see. So I now have the command line here, mobgen. Um, it's already installed. One thing that I didn't find a workaround for, um, if you install mobgen, it installs it in the go path. Also means that your project needs to line the go path, which is not optimal. So uh, I haven't found a way around working in, in a project use go modules, I meaning it can be situated anywhere in your file system. So that was a bit restricting. Um, so I'm not a fan of that particular feature, but it just happens to be the case there. So if we look at the, the files there, so let's see, um, just to bring up my activated screener again. Um, so we have this mock object. That's the object we want to mock, right? So, and uh, then we have a test writing against this. And this is the mocked object, right? How do you generate this? You basically just, um, see, could we see if I get this right? Um, mock again, and then say source. Well, okay, I mean, take this mock object. And in this instance, that's the, one of the modes, the menu mode destination. Uh, how do I call it? It'll stick to the same name, so I know that will hopefully also do its job. And then you basically generate this, this mock out of the box. Um, and every time you change the um, signature of your interface, for example, you need to rerun this, right? It doesn't get feedback, but it usually works out. So um, that, that should be the kind of um, idea. So if you were to remove a method, you need to run it again, for example. If you were to add the method or modify the signature, you need to run this um, as well. It always prefix um, the package name with mock, which is not super helpful in this instance, because I want all the packages, uh, all the files to sit in the same package right now. So the test function is to the has easy access to all the functionality, but let's let's have a look about this uh, in this generated mock. Uh, mock. Remember, this is the structure, interface structure. If you look at um, this here, you'll find um, there's something injected there. So you have a you know general struct here called mockdb service. So it kind of prefixes basically with the file name in the first place uh, and creates a substructure in there. On the one hand, is the controller reference to the controller of GoMock itself. Um, and then the recorder. And you, if you just look at the implementation, um, let's see, let's take, um, yes, so then we have um, certain functions that kind of uh, are, are a bit, may appear a bit strange, but there's basically a constructor here. It says new mockdb service. It basically creates a instance of this, of this implemented service with this controller. Um, a reference basically, and it instantiates the service, this, this, this whole uh, uh, mock um, instance, and the recorder that's attached to it. And then um, when you look into the functions as they implement, if recall there was a count function, for example, um, what does it actually do? Well, it injects a um, call um, to the controller, which basically takes the signature of this particular service, so here the, the count in particular, and uh, basically uses this to record it in the background. So this, this whole controller has only one purpose to record any invocation uh, to a particular service. Let's look at an example where we also have a, an input. And it's just a bit insert, for example, here. So, Recall there was the uh, idea of having a DB um, function that basically just says uh, insert and basically inserts a string in this particular instance, so the signature is adopted and uh, it runs on the uh, very same service, um, makes reference to yeah, um, yeah, some, some, some boilerplate stuff, um, but fundamentally then actually uh, ma makes this call to the uh, mockdb service using the function insert and basically with the argument. So every time you get an, you get an invocation, it basically um, 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 invokes this controller and the recorder with the reference to the function that's invoked and all the arguments that are associated with this. That's the, that's the um, basic idea and returns then error. So it's kind of auto generates um, uh, this kind of um, yeah, uh, templates basically. Um, this um, 
functionality this implementation. So you see, super simple. It does not remotely resemble any sort of implementation that you would rather want to have, right? So there's no meaningful implementation there uh, per se, and that shouldn't be because this file is always auto generated and regenerated every time you recreate it. So you shouldn't mess with it either. But this is fundamentally the file that's going to be invoked when you think about the uh, the mock. So and uh, to kind of motivate this usage, now we look at the client side. So what we've seen as up to now is basically uh, how do we de define the interface? How do we generate the mock? But OK, now we need to use it right from a practical perspective. And this is an interlinkage with the testing framework again. So always kind of the uh, activity is always framed by the by a testing environment. And we now want to assume that the server side records all the invocations, but uh, the ultimate uh, the, the testing uh, or the evaluation is presented using this kind of testing environment. So how does it work? Well, first thing, there needs to be a, a new mock controller. It's a standard boilerplate of GoMob be uh, instantiated with reference to the testing instance, the test runner. Um, and it also um, important here is to indicate the, for the, the finish of the mock controller, because this is the point in time where the actual evaluation happens. So uh, you guys use defer, right? Does everyone know what defer stands for? One of the coolest features, I guess, in, in Golang that I really like um, as a sometimes lazy programmer. What does defer do again, please? Just to um, reinforce it. You should see it in so, so a lot of kind of um, context where there's um, you know, um, services are um, invoked or so, yeah, services are created um, or some sort of concurrent activity occurs. Keep stream open, not quite. Well, implicit to some extent, but what does the fur do? I bet my talked about it. I would be surprised if not. But if not, then I'll fix it. So. Well, the uh, let's see, so we can I'll chat. Correct. Yes. Thank you very much. So in the chat is a response. The idea is basically um, it will um, call the command, whatever you specify there. In this instance, uh, called finish on mock controller, right? So it's actually a mock controller and say call finish afterwards. But it, the defer means run it at the end as soon as before you leave scope, basically. Right, so it will run at the end of this particular test uh, function quite nicely. So it's really beautiful if you allocate resources, you want to ensure they clean up at the end, just run it with the further cleanup, then you don't need to worry about it. So it's a really nifty feature, actually. But it also means finish in this particular instance, of course, calls the functionality of the mock controller. And the, the functionality of the mock controller is very simple. It basically just evaluates you know, uh, the invocations that have happened, right? So remember that the idea is to record all the invocations and at some stage they need to be evaluated and this is literally happening at the end of that execution of that uh, test function so that's the idea but it's fundamentally linked by the reference to the test runner that's injected into the mock controller during instantiation in the first place okay so now we need to afterwards after having set up this bit um it's about instantiating the actual mock so recall as i mentioned just before um, the the the, the uh, GoMock framework basically generates a kind of constructor um, for any mocked um, um, file um, by prefixing it with uh, yeah, well basically called new mock in a way um, or yeah new and then um, service name uh, in, in in kind of um, standard Polish notation and the um idea is basically that you have reference to the mock that you can invoke but only then will define will 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 happen the relevant part that is the definition of the expected behavior so in a mock you need to tell now the mock okay how much you know invocations do i actually want right so we haven't done any of that we just know we have the infrastructure to record invocations but we haven't had any sort of um, um specification happening in the mock or elsewhere and so on that's happening here so we're basically um, signaling the expectation that the mock should have at the end of the execution. So when's it, when, once you basically run the mock control finish, that's the kind of evaluation that will happen, whether those expectations here have been met. And uh, to do this, you basically chain um, the, um, the following commands, basically a reference to the mock. It will always include an expect function. So that indicates everything following here. 
is a form of expectation. It's kind of a DSL to, um, to, to specify expectations on all the resources contained in the mock. And um, following this one, you basically pick any of the methods um, that are implemented now or mocked in this particular instance. So in this instance, it would be in it. And following this one, you can parameterize further, further aspects of it. Um, for example, do you want to have constraints on how often um, this particular function is invoked? So here, for example, times one. You could also say, um, you know, maximum times one. Perhaps you're more interested in uh, suggesting that this invocation could be optional, but early just, um, yeah, let's, let's just leave it for now like this. Um, So at the end of the evaluation, then uh, this expectation records the expectation effectively that a call to init is happening maximum one time. The second one uh, is basically uh, ensuring that insert is called with some item and called two times, and certainly after the invocation to the first call. So it needs to happen after init, right? And then there's the third, uh, for example, um, specification that um, looks at um, the specification of the count invocations so it must be invoked minimum one time but maximum two times whatever else so there's quite a bit of features you can think about and also it has this implicit ordering element uh, embedded in there um, which is basically saying after a particular call next one um, actually also expects some sort of uh, content the call to get with some item and it can be called any times also after a previous call and so on and then there's delete all which can happen can be called any times uh, or not at all. And then basically, so with having specified those expectations, this is the full setup of the mock. Now the actual testing comes. This is where you, for example, uh, invoke, you know, um, run your client side behavior, right? In, uh, insert something, init something, delete something, count something and so on. And the behavior evaluation basically is reflected here. What is called with which parameters and how, for example, how many times and in which order. So those are the kind of uh, testing primitives that you have at avail so um, to kind of um, and, um, do this basically and it just boils down to be a regular test so we can just this version should be run of course without much uh, much problem and then we play around a bit and see what's actually happening if things go um, otherwise so this is this is evidently working because we certify the requirements right we are, we're calling in it one time we're calling some item two times um, and then calling count uh, also two times and so on. So, but what, ha what happens if we, for example, just uh, yeah, let's, let's say we're shifting around this invocation here. Oh, blind typing, there you go. With this one here. So we, um, what I did, I basically shifted the order a bit to sort of, kind of motivate um, that um, challenge a bit. And turns out suddenly, of course, we get a fail. And let's look at how this, how this kind of, um, ref how this, this is reflected in the, um, in the error. Uh, because you need to um, take a while and kind of look at some of those errors to get more comfortable with reading them. That's uh, the main point. So basically, you have an unexpected call to, to count, and then you get the reason here, because the structure is always the same of the error because um, it doesn't have it doesn't have the prerequisite call um, sorry the prerequisite um, call is satisfied and the idea is that here the prerequisite call would have been the one to insert right so because in the expectation here we signal clearly that count must only be called after insert, right? This ordering is uh, kind of reflected as well. So it's not just enough to call something sufficient amount of times or uh, with the right content, but also you can be very clear about the order of the behavior. And that's, that's something that's reflected here. So um, let's, if we remove, for example, this reference, then it should kind of work without much fuss because we give up on the order. Uh, you just say, you know, whatever, as long as it's called two times, we're about happy. And the same is also here, for example, delete, right? We could delete, uh, we could have any um, frequency of deletes, perhaps not calling it at all, perhaps five, calling it five times in any order. So this is not really linked to any of the um, behavioral expectations of the rest. 
Yep. So that um, should work as well. We didn't call it the all this instance. Uh, and of course, the obvious, uh, more obvious uh, issues that you may encounter as well is that uh, if you forget, oh, sorry, if your um, expectations are not met with respect to content, this also is um, picked up on as well. So let's see if I can uh, quickly. Ah, it didn't pick up on this. Hang on, what did it say? It ah, get is not even uh, blah, 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 any times, right? So let's see. Let's call get mock and provide the wrong string. Wrong string. So let's see if that will happen because it tolerates any sort of invocations as long as it happens after count. So we meet that requirement, but that will probably not work here. And this looks as follows. So basically unexpected call to get, right? So it uh, picks up on the get call here uh, in the record um, because it doesn't match the argument at index zero. So basically what it says, um, you, um, you got this one here, wrong string, but you wanted something that's equal to some item as specified here, right? So it's just about uh, matching the, 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 the um, arguments that have been passed, passed through a particular function as well. So this is the kind of flexibility and uh, features that you um, that you that you get um, that you get on the um, um, yeah you know, for, for mocking. So uh, there are some questions I want to respond to. Let's see. Um, Okay, yep, so that's um, the CC reference. Why did you, uh, you call mock expect on the first three, but not the last two? I, I did, but the only thing, thing I didn't do is assign, if I'm not sure if that's what you mentioned, but here they also have mock expect, but I didn't assign a reference to those two calls because I didn't want to have an explicit ordering required anymore. Recall that delete is not linked in any way to the preceding calls, right? So for example, um, here uh, init is only to be called after, sorry, uh, insert is only to be called after init, which is signaled by the reference um, to the uh, instance of that particular expectation. And uh, similarly here, I wanted to uh, signal that um, the get call is only happening after the count call, but for the lead any times, we don't have that linkage. So that's why I didn't um, make any reference to those ones, same, same for those ones here. So there's no expectation about um, ordering, uh, at least for, um, um, for this item, um, specifically for the count or for delete. Or I hope that's a um, response um, to that question. But that's the idea. That's the whole infrastructure, the kind of the setup you want to think about. What is invoked? How often is it invoked? With which content is it invoked? And in which order is it invoked? Those are the major features that are defined as behavior uh, as far as um, um, the, the GoMock is uh, particularly concerned. There are some other features you can do um, but I think those are the common ones you would feel, find being uh, done. So there's an invocation you could do. Um, there's an expectation about um, uh, return values. That's right. Um, minimum times. But yeah, anyway. So that's just some, a sense of the features you have and yet you could, could possibly explore. So it would be quite nice. For example, if you had, uh, now putting it in practice briefly before I le le have you, let you have a break, um if you wanted to think about like the invocation of an external service you can just check hey uh, with one request from a client side you could only get one or two let's say invocations on the third party services but if you get 50 suddenly this framework will pick up on it quite quickly right so you don't need to worry about the server side activity per se you just check for the invocation so it would be a very quick way of figuring out that something is going wrong on your client as opposed to going something wrong on your server which would be the other test right where you basically mock your server and see or you use the actual handler using the HTTP test server and see if you get wrong responses to a given request um, that's the basic idea okay so now you have a breakfast and then uh breakfast break comma no break space first and um then I briefly uh, apply this and see how we can use or to be honest app use to some extent for this purpose of HTTP testing because it's not as straightforward as it was for this particular case. So we reconvene in uh, 15 minutes, that would be 20 past four. Fraction, it turns out, um, um, the, um, someone found out already um, while, while showcasing is the mo modules are now supported for GoMock as well. So it should be straightforward to run mocking 
sorry, rerun the projects also outside of your um, Go path for whatever reason it didn't work on my machine. I don't, I don't quite know. Anyway, I'll figure it out as well. But uh, it can work with modules as well, so that's that's good um, news in the first place. But the yeah, the principle is fundamentally always the same. Um, okay, so right. So I talk a bit of mocking in a kind of abstract sense, but also looking at an abstract concept of a let's say DB service or something like this with a fixed interface that you're kind of comfortable with with fixed input data, primitive type input data, um, like strings, for example, could also be numeric and all this. Um, but now how do we use it, for example, in the context of our uh, web, um, web environment, web setting? So that's slightly, slightly more challenging, to be honest, um, and for a very uh, specific reason. So it's the other folder. Uh, by the way, all this, those files are provided in the um, in the repository on the Proc 2005 2021. So you can just have a look there and see if you can uh, uh, explore. Well, uh, you know, uh, explore further, use it as a basis, a variation, or whatever else for your own um, development. So, ideally. Um, how we want to would want to do it, it would be great if we could abstractly say, I want to have a mock that pretty much represents a, um, a function only, right? So recall that um, the handler function for any test server is always, you know, the function with fixed signature, right? So it has the response writer as its first parameter and then the request preference as its um, second parameter. And so rest best pointer, sorry. And um, it would be great if the system was able to uh, mock um, the, the go mock environment would be able to generate a dummy response that you, uh, or set it up in a way so we can actually meaningfully evaluate it. The problem is here that uh, no two requests will be the same, right? Even though you send the same request, is of course slightly more complex. If you look at the request structure, for example, where can we do this? Let me just If we look at the request structure and how it's made up, let's see if we see a bit of API magic here. Let's see this. So um, we'll find that this struct holds a lot of different um, parameters that are um, to some extent controllable, but to some extent are also um, you know, specific to your particular request. Um, and it becomes a very unfeasible to kind of remodel all those ones. Um, let alone some of them can be dynamic. For example, the URL is never fixed. The server side URL for the HTTP test server is determined by the server and you're just supposed to hand it through um, and uh, as part of your testing. Part of the idea there is also to change it uh, or to keep it flexible is to ensure that your tests are independent from the URL or the service you, server you're hosting it on, right? So it should be a, a certain dissociation. So this becomes quite problematic if you wanted to kind of re-specify this entire uh, set of features um, that are provided here, let alone their references to other, um, you know, um, elements, third party elements. So how do we do this practically? And the idea is basically there um, for the purpose of um, the requests, we can't really implement the entire, uh, we, we can't just uh, delegate it to a mock requ uh, request handler per se, but in fact, we need to identify the relevance, relevant elements um, from that handler that we are um, interested in. So I just make up two. Um, um, so here basically is the server side interface. And the idea is basically just to have a signature of the elements that are relevant for assessment for you, right? So if you're, for example, only interested in um, the correct HTTP method and the content type that is called, right? Or the content only itself. And then you can come up with a kind of signature that reflects this. I made it up here in a sense that there's a request signature that consisting of two strings, where I simply assume that the first one will be something I test for with focus on method, HTTP method, and the second one will be something I test with focus on content type. But also have a third one with content, or fourth one with HTTP protocol. Doesn't really matter. That's really up to you because you need to manually do uh, the mapping into the corresponding signature. The main point here, however, is that uh, it is um, easy to um, assess the correctness of um, those invocations um, quite straightforward, right? So 
that's the that's the whole idea sitting behind it. So I in this instance I made two uh, signatures quite straightforward, and they um, the generated mock looks somewhat like this. Uh, again, the structure is always um, the, the 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 boilerplate structure is always the same. We have kind of a struct that carries the mock controller and recorder. Those two elements go go together. Um, and then at some stage, you see here this uh, constructor that is also generated um, based on the um, name. Um, and eventually, we arrive at the uh, mocked methods. So request content only was one of my interface methods, takes one parameter. This is uh, handed through to the recorder. Um, and then if there is, there's the other one, request signature. Um, if that occurs, that's also handed through to the recorder, uh, uh, or, yeah, to, to, to the mock controller um, as well. So again, also generated, not something to look at per se, the most important thing, the workflow is always the same. Specify uh, the interface, generate the mock using mock again, mock again, source and destination. And um, in the test, then we tie everything together again. So let's have a look how, it's, how we do it here. Um, in fact, it's reasonably, um, yeah, reasonably straightforward, but probably I should actually do it the other way around instead of um, modeling the expectations here. They're probably better modeled after the server because then it makes a bit more sense. Because once we have the infrastructure set up, then it's um, more sensible to actually define the expectations and then the tests so it looks a bit cleaner. Okay, so uh, we set up the mock controller. Again, we call defer finish. So evaluation happens, happens at the end of the um, test function in particular. I create an instance. And then now I'm using, because I want to emulate server-side behavior, I'm using the HTTP test package again, right? So we create a new server with a single uh, request handler that has, of course, our usual um, signature the response writer, response reader. So of course, it would be beautiful to kind of directly assess, is this request correct? Because that's most likely what we're going to test on. But again, uh, given the, com uh, the complexity of this uh, struct, you wouldn't want to kind of try to rebuild this uh, in an accurate way or um, um, so on, um, uh, the content in particular. So the idea is basically, let's take the request, take apart the relevant elements or extract the relevant elements and redirect them into the mocked interface. And that's how it basically works. Right now, I'm just reading the content, and I care about the method and the content type, if you if you like. Um, and then we basically redirect everything into the mock. So um, again, mock is a reference to this new mock server that has this mock controller embedded in it. And then you should have access to the um, functions. So re request signature, you redirect, for example, the request method, HTTP, post, get, put, whatever, um, and the header. So if I'm only interested for example, in assessing a particular header, the content type one, I would want to redirect um, the content of content type, um, the content type header itself. And as I mentioned uh, before, I made, just for the sake of demonstration, a separate function that is only evaluating um, content. So the idea is here to redirect content. What you, of course, don't capture, if things go south here in this, uh, you know, handler, which you kind of use as kind of blue code in a wider sense, that's of course not assessed by the by the tests uh, per se then by the mock itself, but it would at least pick up on the fact that something was invoked or was not invoked or that the values are off or wrong. So, okay, so that's the server side um, specification the handler that basically just waits for requests and then redirects the the, the uh, input that it gets into the mocked functions. Again, we defer the close as well. Same for the mock and the same for the server. So everything is closed properly behind us. And then uh, specify the expectations, for example, right? So we expect that uh, we have uh, a call to request signature. That was the one with the two strings um, to be post and text plain, right? So this is kind of a convention that, I, of course, I need to negotiate myself. The only thing that the system cares about is that uh, the type of um, those particular functions just knows there are two functions of types plain. Right? So, and I need to both signal the expectations that I have for the invocation um, and, of course, invoke accordingly. And then we have an argument. Uh, the second one would be the content type I want to be um, testing for, which like, maybe test plane, right? And then um, we may have uh, the call to the other function, which is um, the request content only one with different content, for example, right? So, again, I can qualify this 
both in terms of the order in which things should happen, but also with respect to the um, let's do this. Um, with respect to the content that is actually done. So let's see the security form. So here, this way, we could make it hard and fast to ensure that invocation to the um, first um, interface or the first function needs to happen before the second one or something. And then the invocation. So this is the basis for an evaluation on the server side that happens when this happens, when this is called, right? Content, uh, when finish is called uh, at the end of the scope of this function or the test function in particular. So now we do the actual, well, tests in the widest sense that we basically just invoke um, the server, right? As we would from a client side. So there's actually not really meaningful evaluation happening here other than just uh, checking if something went wrong on the client side when in creating the request to the server, right? So very basis, just check for errors there, but not really evaluate any of the responses. We're just interested in kind of invoking the server and then the server, we're actually doing the recording, right? So the invocation. So here basically with the default client, we send a post request standard using the TS URL, that's the temporary URL from the HTTP test server instance. And uh, yeah, provide the corresponding uh, content that we want to, you know, signal content type explain being here and the content uh, as uh, passed along some content as, as an uh, error. And we do the same for, uh, you know, other requests variably reflecting what we expect in terms of the invocation, right? So if we expect um, two calls, um, or sorry, one call with one, one content, and then the different call um, content two times. Let's see how this is the case here. So that's exactly what we have. We know that there's a redirection happening into two um, functions on the server side. So this should correspond to two calls on the server side. And then we have two separate calls with a different content here, basically. That's to be expected um, afterwards. So if I run this, it would, of course, run properly. And then we can just kind of play with it a bit to see if we want to break it. Ah, it's broken already. Cool. All right. What happened? Um, unexpected call to um, the request signature. So post checks plain. Ah, okay. Because uh, the calls have been exhausted, right? So it means you actually um, called to have too many calls. Nice example. So here then it becomes increasingly. Uh, uh, he, that's basically a stack trace gives you a, yeah, a, a readable version there of telling you what actually went wrong. Also note here, it actually exposed the uh, URL of the test server, right? So in this incident ran on port 58,997, uh, that can vary any time. So you cannot uh, rely on this, but was it basically mean that the request signature was invoked too often? So let's see this one here. Oh, it says actually any time. So that shouldn't work, uh, shouldn't hurt. Why does it uh, expect any times? Ah, right. Okay, now I get it. Um, because um, uh, recall that any call to the uh, web server, any post, actually uh, is redirected to both functions, right? The request signature on the one hand, the content only. But by tying it down to say um, that the content can only be invoked after the signature, uh, it um, will not work because um, if I have a, the, the second invocation will violate this order um, if I have then a subsequent call to the header again um, because the ordering is the problem. So let's see, let's try that again. Takes a while. Okay. So. And yeah, so basically, this is the same game now. You can, you know, selectively vary the uh, invocations that we um, that we want. Um, for example, have max times so or into that two. So it would also give us a bit of flexibility to invoke uh, less than two times if we wanted to. No, which still fly. That should work, yeah. So it should work. But if you have an excessive, um, yeah. So let's restructure. 
So that's basically the idea. If you were to uh, wanted to, for example, uh, of course, I mean, this is completely made up. If you wanted to, for example, do an assessment on uh, the request signature and also include um, content here as well, not just content type, that's equally possible, of course, right? The only thing is that you basically need to rerun the, um, uh, the uh, Linux word, uh, rerun basically uh, the mockgen uh, command to kind of recon reconstruct this. So let's see, um, white folder, that's right, mockgen source. Um, I played with HTTP mock object pro and have a destination of HTTP mock object dot again. Just pull this back up. Um, yep. Rerun this. And that should have changed apart from all in this prefix here, which I probably could also conversely do uh, by introducing it to the interface. Um, the only thing I need to do now is basically to adapt my tests because um, we should see that the implementations, of course, have changed. Let's have a look again. Uh, content only is the same. The request signature now consists, consists of three strings as arguments that are redirected into the uh, controller for, for assessment. So now my tests will, of course, not no longer work. So the Bessie says, well, you know, I also need to assess for content uh, for yeah for content here in this particular instance in any case meet the match the signature um yeah it also affects my handler my dummy handler here that probably needs to do some sort of um redirection now as well so i just have you know a duplicate in a way um and the rest should be fine so if i run this again it should probably give me An error it gives me. What happened? So, uh, and different content. All right, 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 right. right. Okay, let's see. Um, so the problem here is that uh, now, of course any call um, to the or any request to the server is redirected into the request signature which now takes three parameters which is on the one hand method the other one is content type and of course the actual content so by i hadn't accommodated the fact that um that there's a, a the, the last request basically uses different content so it suggests that it basically uh, um, does not match so if we if you just briefly look at the um tracy again perhaps to help this idea is basically Here's the unexpected call. I didn't want to have any call and request signature with this parameter set. What's the issue? Well, I have an issued argument index two, meaning a third argument, and basically says, uh, this is what I got, and this is what I wanted. So that's the indicator here. Um, all right, so let's see, let's set this content here just to make it explicit. And since we are so, Flexible, you just say invocation can occur any time that should actually, uh, let's see what happens here. That break, that could actually, yeah, okay, it actually picks up on it. Cool, okay, the, the, um, the mock again, uh, yeah, kind of auto uh, assesses the correct um, invocations here. So, so basically by now having variably the call uh, with this form of content, this form of content, we solve this kind of issue. We can also tie it down a bit if you wanted to and say times one, for example, and times two. You of course want to be as specific as possible, but no, that's the wrong statement. You want to be as specific as necessary to kind of satisfy your, your interface requirements, not necessarily uh, unnecessarily uh, uh, limiting, but um, there's a good way of counting the number of invocations you actually do. So now I'm slightly more specific. I don't just allow any sort of invocation, but I'm specific. This needs to be invoked at least once, this twice, and of course, conversely, those ones as well, which is actually basically just handed through from the handler that I um, used here to redirect my requests. So, Okay, that was the overview of the mocking side using GoMock as one particular instance of a, a mocking framework.
questions on your part? No particular questions? Someone clear? Who wants to do this? I take this as a yes. They all want to do it. Brilliant. Uh, the, the nine students that are here. Um, that's good. Thanks, by the way, for using check-in. Now you checked in the break. Everyone seems to have checked in. That's great. Um, so uh, yeah, but you could cons uh, consider at least what you want to take away from this is basically that there's um, you know various various forms of um, you know testing that you can think about when you look at your project. You know, question is what are you interested in? Is it really more the um, the client side, the server side that uh, is primarily relevant for you, um, or simply unit testing? So if you have just a function, you just want to test it, you don't care about the whole HTT business, just because you, you have a you know prediction algorithm or uh, some uh, data structure reorganization and and so on. That's the case where you just you know use regular unit testing, quite simplistic, quite straightforward, and you know very minimal the examples and kind of atomic in a sense that test one functionality at you know one time. Uh, but when it comes to the uh, testing of um, um, server functionality, either from client or server side, you're immediately getting this the area of kind of integration tests already, right? So where you really have multiple components interacting with each other. So there you, of course, also test primarily kind of the interface between the components, but leave the testing of, uh, you know, functionality, for example, uh, business logic on the server side uh, or any of that kind of that, that kind of stuff to regular unit testing, right? So for, for you, it will therefore be quite important to think about a modularization of your code. So for example, if your handler, um, for example, calls third party, so I mean, your, your service handler calls third party services, but does some sort of data organization in between, well, this data organization between probably should be offloaded in a dedicated function, right? That is just called from the handler. So this makes your um, project much more testable because you can then test just this conversion functionality, let's say you are getting the um, country, uh, um, the, the, the um, uh, date format number one, I guess, from, uh, from rest countries or from the currency exchange, or whatever else, and you provide it in date format number two, right? This conversion of the date format, which is a pain in its own right, um, is probably something you want to offload in the de dedicated function because then it comes separate, you can test it separately, irrespective of all this integration test. Uh, 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 functionality, then it also is more sensible that you are happy with dummy responses from the service from a server side handler just to see that the principal connectivity on you know fixed values because you don't care of course about the particular exchange rate for example uh, in this instance just to test the connectivity uh, then you can just stop this kind of part of the functionality uh, and leave uh, you know the business logic to dedicated uh, unit testing. Right? So, but. So to, the way to do it basically is just to use the testing framework and use the HTTP te test server. I would encourage everyone to at least try it, like the HTTP test server one. Just spin it up. It's super straightforward. Use the example and substitute perhaps with the, don't write even a stop, meaning perhaps just use your actual handler uh, if you want, and just to see, especially if it's simple functionality. If it's kind of uh, um, uh, draws on third party resources, then it's really hard to test against it, of course. You probably then need to kind of stop it, meaning, you know, uh, make it, make a variant, simplified variant of it that fixes information if you like. Uh, but if it doesn't do that, but has a fixed functionality, you can just redirect it or immediately attach it to your HTTP test server instance, and then write client-side tests against it, right? So that's something I would definitely recommend doing. And, but if you really then also want to go as far as to test client-side behavior, and that would be interesting for your client-side requests to third-party services, not testing your clients as in us as possible users or anyone as possible users of your service, um, then you, you know, should contemplate just trying out uh, GoMog, especially if you use the same services again as we have already, like COVID, uh, probably would be worthwhile to be really rock solid on the invocations you're performing, or, uh, or if you know already that you are performing frequent invocations, for example, currency tickers or whatever else, um, that would probably be a good idea. Then you can just try it out and see um, how your client actually behaves under certain um, circumstances, or if you get unexpected um, behavior there. So that's the idea between those different perspectives. So they're all kind of looking at the same beast, but from different perspectives, right? Micro level and then micro level one server side, client side and so on. And this is not hard and fast because you can bend any test to, you know, perform kind of on either side, but it's kind of the more um, um, prototypical usage or use case for all those different approaches that we have um, seen above and um, talked about a bit in this um, session. 
provided you with a um, set of resources to all those um, tools that are referenced. So GoMock is the one that has uh, slowly found its introduction into the main repo. And um, this is um, yeah, probably something worthwhile looking at. Again, it supports modules, so uh, you should not shy away from trying it out. Um, the other thing that I talked about last time was the use of assertions again, just mention that if you're used to assertions, for example, from using JUnit before, you know, assert nil, assert not false, assert false, uh, or whatever else, right, or assert true, uh, if you like that uh, uh, kind of um, very simple um, uh, form of writing, writing tests, then just uh, look at that repo there, it's quite, quite neat, it's reasonably well maintained, it's quite stable, um, so um, feel free to use that one as well. It, it makes tests much more um, descriptive in a way of actually what you want to evaluate and also gives you more meaningful error messages other than, you know, of course, creating them yourself, which is, can be a bit tedious. That says it's an external dependency. So it's a bit of a thing there um, that to, to be uh, borne in mind. The other two links are basically just links to um, resources that are, um, um, you know, clarifying stuff and mock differences over time from different perspectives. Um, as they have been um, the case. Okay, um, cool. So that's it actually from my side largely. Um, I wanted to start or will want to start talking about virtualization a bit more, but it doesn't make sense to start this in the last five minutes. Uh, that's really beating the point here, especially since it's nearly five o'clock um, and the sun is shining. So you probably need to use that as well for, for, for you know compensation for the Hard work on the one hand, but also long winter that we had so far. Um, I provide all the resources and uh, video and so on. Feel free to use the demos. Feel free to seek uh, inspiration thereof. I mean, any code that I provide there, I provide for a reason, right? You can download this, you can run it, you can use it, right? So make it yours, or um, you know, um, I also provided the remember this 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 um, stuff for uh, you to kind of emulate. Um, server side responses, especially now in your project, you may want to try out different services. So if you want to have a very stable you know response irrespective of network connectivity and so on just host your own um response or json structure or whatever it really is uh using this this, this stuff and um, just redirect the url so you kind of are not dependent on third-party entities especially if you want to avoid having test uh, sorry the rate limit um challenges that we have Cool. The slide here is just a summary. I should have talked about the summary of the GoMock uh, activity that, that I did. So if you want to set up your own one, that's basically the kind of steps you will need to walk through uh, that are described here, right? The interface, um, the, um, the, the uh, interface specification, the uh, generation of the mock, then the test writing and so on. So it's basically um, just as a, as a cheat sheet, no, not cheat sheet, that's not the right way, but a kind of an overview uh, reminder, if you like, um, to ensure you implement it correctly. Good. All right. So this will be um, the last session on, on testing. Um, yeah, feel free to draw on any resources we have there. On Wednesday, I'll just start talking about virtualization because we need to get closer to Docker. Man, many of you will have used it or a question, who has actually used it? I mean, the ones, yes. Did you learn that anywhere else? So uh, you data engineers, right? So you didn't learn about Docker yet, right? Or, is, or perhaps some of you or not, or wherever. It depends a bit on the kind of courses, I guess, you chose, right? The electives. If anyone has taken a, um, a operations course, for example, from EEC in particular, it's very likely that you uh, came across Docker already. Lee Proc, you came across Docker already? Which, 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 which course, just to give me a feel. VVV uh, technology. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, makes sense. That's the logical course to use. It doesn't surprise me. So that's good enough. So um, that is helpful for me because then I know how to kind of, uh, yeah, I know. Um, there are some, some candidates definitely that I know. Most certainly they have used Docker in, uh, in, in, in this independent of their degrees. And especially if you're in working life already, of course, very likely you have come across. In fact, that's part of the motivation to talk about it. You kind of need to know it if you go out there eventually, irrespective of your study direction and if you're dealing with software because it becomes so relevant. But it, I will also hold it reasonably pain-free, actually. That's the main point here. It's more like a utility to make deployment easy as opposed to causing you unnecessary pain. If you want to have pain in Docker, it's also that possible, go to EEC again, because they really use it until EEC information security. They, they use it, uh, you know, to, uh, I think, 
you know, pretty much exploit the whole feature set because it becomes really interesting if you're running server infrastructure, I mean, you know, running your AWS environment yourself and really have a complex setup of services, it becomes really interesting to combine with um, other technologies such as uh, Kubernetes as well and so on. Um, and uh, to spin up a much more complex setup than we probably do. But what you will want to get take away from this is like how to make your life easy in deployment, not harder, right? So remember the screen pane that we had in doing deployment on, on the uh, OpenStack or whatever other, some people try to want to write services, native uh, services in, uh, for system D in Ubuntu specific, all that pain should hopefully go away if we use Docker, we'll see about this. So don't, don't um, uh, you should look at it with anticipation, not fear. So that's, the, <laughs> uh, that's all I want to say. Ah, oh, yeah, good point here. Yeah, that's right. Uh, comment Docker and Windows is pretty painful in its own right. It's absolutely true. There's, there's a reason why we make a strong emphasis or put a strong emphasis on Linux tech, because it's just the way you run stuff on the server side, right? Client doesn't matter, do what you want. On the server side, you kind of use uh, Linux in a way. And it's very natural that it will be painful on Windows for a particular feature that's or for a feature that's particular to Linux. That's why Docker runs so well on it, even though there have been attempts and increasing attempts, I guess, to really run it on Windows. Uh, it always felt painful looking at how people did this. So um, I will not uh, pollute my machine by even attempting it. Anymore. So but anyway, that's just a bit of a, a heads up on uh, what we talk about on Wednesday. If there are no more questions from your part or comments, then I leave it at this and uh, see you on uh, Wednesday at, what is it, 8 o'clock? Oh, 10 o'clock? Wow, then the sun is up already. Okay, cool. Well, we'll make it uh, 10 o'clock, that is. Cool. Thank you very much for your attention.